Ways to be cool. Um, so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about like the way that I engage design and passion. I teach at OCAD, I run a design think tank and creative agency called Architects that really works on helping people enable design as an active thing and work from an authentic place. Um, and so this, I show you that slide because if you have a preconceived notion of what is good, you cannot actually be creative. So I finished school uh, five years ago, I was going into the world between academics and practice, what do I want to do? I don't just want to talk about architecture, I don't just want to build it, I want to use it in an active way. Um, and so I wasn't really sure where that place was. And so I started sort of poking around through the architecture world. These were the peers that I met. The average age of an architect is over 50. Um, and so this was the community that I was engaging in, and it just didn't feel quite right. Um, so I thought about think tanks in Ottawa and how they put out white papers, and I'm like, why can't we have a creativity think tank that puts out creative work as its, as its work? Um, and at the back of my mind, I was thinking, you know, architecture is a human right. Food, water, and shelter. How do we enable people? How do we enable people to use design as a tool for change? How do we enable people to use a design in a more active way? So all these things sort of percolating in my head. And at the same time, I'm watching all of my friends and peers migrating into these jobs and getting, you know, and this is the schedule that I wanted. Right? Like I wanted to play all day, use play as an active part of my practice, and then be happy and go home. That was the dream. So how do I actually put that together? So my friends are off, they're graduating university, they're going off to the cubicle farms. And I'm thinking, like, and, and their creativity is getting stifled. Right? Like, people are thirsty to be creative, but as they go into these jobs that they think they wanted, they were being less and less creative. So here I am, curious about it. Um, so I started this think tank. And I started to think about, you know, what are the different creative media that we can use to enable architecture and design? Um, and it turned into a bit of a larger question. So we work in policy, we work in education, we work with the federal government right now exploring how play can be enabled as a mechanism for efficiency. Um, we work in conceptual art, we work in film, we use whatever creative media we can get our hands on to get the public and new communities engaged in a discourse about design. So. This is my first paying client, and that's actually not a joke. Um, so about three years ago, I was approached by the city of Toronto, and they said, you know, we have a small amount of money going to a priority neighborhood. I went to a 4,000 square foot, like, repurposed police station in Kingston Galloway Orden Park. For those of you not from Toronto, it's one of our 13 priority neighborhoods. Talked to the director and said, let's get 75 local youth to redesign a building. They, they put the designs together over the course of two years. We worked with them for two years. They designed a 10,000 square foot building, working with over 50 design professionals, from contractors, gra graphic designers, architects, planners, landscape architects, doing zoning, doing planning, understanding what master planning is, sitting in city council meetings, advocating for stormwater stuff on their site. Um, so we worked with these kids once a week, ages 9 to 21, some of the most underprivileged kids in Canada, using design as a tool. Um, and, so, and starting to work in a high-level space, it's actually not really that accessible to people outside of the design community. So here they are, they've learned how to use CAD, they've learned how to do 3D renderings, and they're presenting to city council. They had their site plan approved this summer. They started actual construction on the building, and uh, I think it was in May, they cut the ribbon on the first 2,000 square feet of renovations in their community, which was amazing. So this is the building. This is the average building you see in a priority neighborhood, fairly banal. And these kids are sort of more deeply, it's not youth capacity building, it's helping kids more deeply understand how do you use design for economic development? How do you use design for place-based poverty reduction? How do you design, how do you use design to create innovative ways of resident engagement. And this is their new rendering that they just presented and that garage door you see was actually just blown out today. So it's really, really exciting to see architecture used in this really active way. So outside of working in communities, we also thought it'd be really interesting to use conceptual art. So does everyone know what conceptual art is? It's like art that anyone can make. So it's like an Ellsworth Kelly, it's like a blue painting and you go to the museum and you're like, I could have made that. So, um, so that's what I do. Um, so we created a conceptual art exhibit that explored the intersections of architecture with economics, politics, equality, and let people create their own narrative in the space. So how often do you go to a museum and you can actually touch stuff? 
So we had this one room where there was six models of standard building types, and there was a bucket of ping pong balls, and they all had different demographic groups on it. So what people would do is they'd reach into the bucket and grab a handful of ping pong balls and throw them into the corresponding housing type. Now what people would do is they grab the low-income family and disabled person ping pong balls, and they would throw them back in the main bucket because they didn't actually want to say what they thought. And so we ended up with this bucket. And so people were thirsty for discourse. We realized we had a 40-foot wall. We had over 3,000 Post-it notes left on our wall at the end of the exhibit, basically saying, I am thirsty. I love space. I know space. I, I, use, I use my house every day. I go to work every day. And so we were trying to find a place for these people and for these new communities to engage. So through our process, um, we, my staff and I do this thing called Grapes and Chips, where every Friday we do a creative activity. We fix the cracks in the wall, we make peanut butter sculptures, we write messages for kids on, on playground fences, and play is a huge part of our process and people coming to work with us and people coming to collaborate with us. So we started to think that there's a larger question here. So the rule number one, and my, my next slide's kind of messed up, but play is not easy. Oscar Wilde used to say that if you give a man a mask, he'll show you his true self. And that's really, really, really upsetting because you, know, you see people on Halloween and they're their crazy selves, but how do you get them to a place to do creative work without putting them in a costume. So that's our first big challenge. Our second challenge is number two, um, is that play is absolutely necessary. So they say if you give a child a, a, a problem, they'll give you 100 solutions, but if you get, give an adult a problem, they'll give you five. How do we get people to a place, with, as we move from childhood to adulthood, all we gain is inhibitions. So how do we move backwards and get people to that place where they can actually truly be creative? And this is in my studio, and just play is not frivolous. We believe that play is a huge part of like honesty, efficiency, and true, sincere, creative work. So, and I don't have a thank you slide. I'm so sorry, so thank you.